Okay, great. <laughs> Okay, so I, I can um, just do a very quick um, recap on yesterday, because I know that some uh, many people who are going to be here won't, wouldn't have been at yesterday's session. Uh, I know Craig is uh, got to leave in about half an hour, so we thought we would start today with a bit of troubleshooting with those who are working with the crafty bit and a little get up and go kind of coding um, workshop on that. Then we're going to talk more broadly about um, the scope of programming and logo and um, just different examples uh, that that we think are, are, are make for interesting conversation about um, computational thinking and what you can do with logo that we find very intriguing. Um, and uh, and then of course we we can answer specific questions uh, relating to what you might be having trouble. I know that or to relating to code and, and things. Um, so I, I think I think we can start. Um, so maybe, uh, Craig, I wonder if we can start with a, um, yeah, if you wanna take over and do a, a, like a, a brief primer on, on the block-based part of, of the crafty bit, and then we can um, move from there. Does that make that sense? Works for me. Yeah. I'm shooting from the hip, so if I'm saying something that doesn't make sense, just interrupt. It's fine. All right. Well, that's Let's see. And if you can just turn on screen sharing. Oh, I apologize. Yeah. No, no worries. Okay. Should be good. All right. So I've got this. My Robert. My desk. All right, great. So in my thumbnail, you should hopefully see crafty bit LED, and then I've got the blocks language up here. Yeah, let's just start looking at this, um, I'm play, building a couple of projects. I'm going to put the crafty bits uh, uh, link in, uh, in the... Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. So in the blocks environment, unlike logo, you actually have to have a starting point, um, starting to connect your code to. So in Scratch your blocks language, we have this when started block and everything will attach. So you notice if you try to throw this block away, it doesn't let you give this block. Uh, and that's really just because the for now craft bits is single threaded. We're not trying to do multi-threading or anything just yet. Um, and really when working with hardware devices that put multi-threading becomes kind of chaotic anyways. The, single threaded projects uh, tend to be a little bit more clear. So we just have the single when started. And maybe we'll just do something really to get it. So I'm gonna go over here to the outputs category. That's the green one. And I tried to color code these uh, relevant to the device. So remember the green, uh, the, the green spring loaded connected to the output. So the output blocks are green and let's pick all LEDs to 74. Uh, 74 is just a color, color table that spans from 0 to 100. And the blocks language is actually kind of nice for this. You get this nice menu that shows you what each of the colors mean. Um, we actually did something to the logo environment that we can show later that does show this table. But for now, I'm just going to pick something in the blue range. And I do need to get connected. So first, I'm going to click on the USB icon. I don't think you can see this pop up, but I'm seeing a, um, a list of devices it sees. I'll click Connect. Uh, and this turns green. That lets me know that I'm connected to the device. The other thing you'll see is you'll get a little game control icon on your Chrome tab. Um, and that's another good way of saying that you're uh, you're actively connected to a device right now. Um, so up, we've got some code here. I'm just going to click the play button and we should all the LEDs go to this blue color. <laughs> Doesn't that always happen? Well, let me just refresh real quick. Let me power cycle this device. I was doing some crazy things to it before. Okay. Let's try this. Craig, do you need to put that in a forever loop or else it's just turning the LEDs all on and then immediately back off? Well, it doesn't. Um, the LEDs will stay on. Oh, actually, okay. it's like I might have broken something here. What's going on? Let me look at the console. 
oh, whoops, maybe that block, you know, the, the blocks language might be a little bit in rough shape. I thought I tested it thoroughly beforehand, but apparently I did not. So let's just try this instead. Looks like there was a bug in the LEDs. Oh, okay. Well, you know what? For now, since we want to focus on the blocks environment, let's ignore the LEDs. I will fix that just after the session today, but I'm just going to go jump over to the servo motor for now because I know I've tested these ones with the blocks environment. So all I did was I just unplugged uh, my ring. I plugged in a servo motor on that connector on the side. Let's give this one a try. Uh, so set servo to zero degrees. Let's wait a second, 1000 milliseconds, and then we'll set servo to, let's do 180, the full range of the servo. We'll try this. Okay, that one's much happier. So now when I click play, again, it sends that code down, it runs through. And then remember now that the code is loaded on the device, all I have to do is bump this button to run that again. So if I run that, the servo will rotate to zero, wait a second, rotate back to 180. Okay. So say we wanna repeat that maybe a couple of times, we can wrap the whole thing in a repeat, we'll put a two. And then it's important to wait before we loop around again, otherwise there won't be any delay between this and this block. So let's just change that, hit play. Okay, and now it should do it twice. Yep. We can play with the timing. I don't know what, I don't know how long it takes. I think it's around 400 milliseconds to go the full range, zero to 180. Let's try it. So now it's really quick back and forth. I can bump the button to run this again. So that's just looking at the, um, just a really basic example using the servo motor. Uh, let's see, we could, we can connect up a uh, sensor to this too. Let's try that. So I have my rotation knob. Yeah. The wire that carries the signal is gonna go into the purple port because that's the input and everything else get wired up to power and ground, okay? So now maybe we just wanna do something like forever, just set the servo motor to whatever my rotation value is. So for that, I'm gonna grab a forever Let's throw all this away. And what we can do is we can say set servo to, and then we go down to our input blocks. Um, in Scratch, there's a sh the shape of a block really tells you some information about it. So the pointed edges are a Boolean. This is only going to return true or false or one or zero. And the rounded edges are reporters. These can give you some analog value. So if we're looking at actually reading the analog value, we want to use that one. And we can just drop that in set servo. And then I'll put a little delay in there just to give it some breathing room. It's probably not totally necessary, but I like to do that sometimes for these fast running loops. Let's run that. And now as I turn the knob, the servo motor is matching my movements. So that's just a really simple program. But if you realize, you know, the, the, sen the input value is only going from zero to 100, and it's not quite the full range of the servo, right? What we can do for that is we can put in an operator We'll go down to these operator blocks and let's just double the range by multiplying it by two. So now we're saying set the servo to the uh, input, uh, read input analog times two. And now if I turn this, the servo motor should go twice as far. So now I can take advantage of that full range of the servo motor. So that's just a quick look at the, um, the blocks language. Uh, there's some other blocks here you can play around with. The boxes are your global variables that we looked at in Logo. Uh, radio boxes are shared between all devices that are kind of within the vicinity of each other. So one thing we could do is we could say, you know, set radio box to uh, read input analog. And then this device would just broadcast its uh, rotation knob value to all the other bits that are nearby. So we could have another bit nearby running something like just like what we had before, but instead we wanna use that radio box. So if this, this stack right here is running on one device with a rotation knob, and this is running on another device with a servo motor, you should be able to map the movements from across the room without these two boards being physically connected with each other. So it's a little bit similar to what we looked at with the logo environment yesterday with Alec. Um, one thing I wanna show you is the last code we uploaded to this was our, our code that said, set the servo to the rotation value times two. 
And this is just kind of like a little bit of a hidden feature, but if I go over to the coding environment, the logo environment and connect up, you'll see we actually can see the code here. So all of this, the blocks code that you, you program actually gets compiled into logo code before it gets uploaded to the device. So if you're really interested at kind of seeing how this translates between the two worlds, this is a nice way of doing it. You can code it up in blocks and then connect it here and you can actually get a, a glimpse of what the code is running. And, and this just works. So now I can run start. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, it started and now it's running this code here. And the way we know it's running is if you look at my little board there, it's got a red LED. If I run stop, it should switch to blue. That tells me it's not running. And we can just run start again to start up that procedure, which again is just mapping the servo motor. So again, if we just power cycle the device, I'm going to pull power off of this. I'm going to plug it back in. So at this point, I'm not connected to the blocks or the logo environment. The device just got power. All I have to do is bump that button to recall the last command, which in this case was start. So I'm going to run that. And now we should be right back in our routine again. So you see this board is already programmed. We don't have to go back to the programming environment to recode this or to start it up again. Uh, all of this is now living, living on, on the device. So it was just a quick overview. Um, if anyone has any questions or thoughts, oh, oh, yeah. sorry, I'm I'm totally missing the chat, and there was all. Oh, no, it's fine. I've got that. I've got that. that. Okay, good, good. So, um, yeah, and then the question: Can you just show again how how the code was converted back and forth? Yep. So, um, we'll do is I'll go back here. So right now I'm not connected to anything. So we're just gonna go ahead and USB connect with the blocks environment, and let's do something really simple. Let's do set servo zero. Wait one second and then set servo to 180. So we'll just do a really simple program like that. We'll hit play to download it to the device and give it a test. Okay, that looked right. I can run it again just to be sure. So it goes zero, wait a second, 180, okay. So now that that's coded in here, all we have to do is I'm just gonna refresh just to disconnect, but I'm gonna jump over to the, the logo environment. Uh, let's refresh just to start with a clean slate so you can see this. And now when I connect to this device, it's just gonna pull in that code automatically. So see to start, set servo zero, wait 1000, set servo 180 end. And this is, so this is basically, these are the blocks that we defined. The to start is kind of that hat block that we had. And here we can just run start. And that's gonna do the same routine. Could, could you really, um, could you just, for those who might be new to this, sort of um, identify more the, relationship between the command and the and the procedure so the left and, and right window oh yes um so right so this is the command center this is for just sort of like running live commands so we can say print one two three four it prints print uh 250 divided by 50 it'll do the math and print back the response so the command center is just kind of like a quick and easy way at poking at the system making it do certain things so right now, if you can see my camera, I have a servo attached to it, right? So I can just say set servo 80 and it goes there, set servo 30. Now it jumps there. I can arrow up and I can just hit return anywhere on this. So I can go back to this line and just hit enter and it's gonna rerun that line again. So now it's back to 80 from this line, back to 30 again. So this is really great for just, you know, doing really simple routines. You could say set servo zero, wait 1000, set servo 180 all on one line like this and just run it and that's really the same procedure all over again but it's just like a one-liner command i can come in here maybe i don't want to wait a full second i just want to wait half a second rerun that again and it has to be so on command. one line uh it does have to be on one line yeah any return a return in here will run whatever command is on that line that you're on you can do a shift return if you want to get a line break like say you just want to give yourself some space and you don't want it to execute you can do a shift return just to give yourself some room so you know all these commands can be embedded so we can say set servo zero wait 1000 print actually i'm going to do print string which is prs hello and then set servo 180 so the servo goes waits a second tells me hello in the system and then goes on to do the 180. So you can really stack up as many commands as you want with this. But so the command center is great for just executing individual things, for running routines. 
But um, if you want to actually start to define these routines or these procedures, that's what this right window is for. So let's just get rid of this one. Uh, let's let's maybe we can code up a sweep command together. And here, let me zoom in a little bit more so you can see this better. So let's define two sweep. Okay. So we're going to use that global variable set box. We'll set box one to zero. We want it to start at zero degrees. We're going to repeat. Since we know the servo has 180 degrees of movement, we can repeat 180. Now we're going to say set servo to box one. Then we're going to increment box one. So set box one to box one plus one. After doing this a bit and then doing it in the blocks language, it does make me think we need a change box, which is like increment the box, but um, that's something we've talked about a bit. And then we're going to put a little delay in there so we don't make our servo motor move too fast. I'm going to do 20 milliseconds. And I think that should be it. So the syntax structure is basically to the name of the subroutine, then all the commands you want in here. Um, all of the spaces and indentations are just for readability. Those aren't required. And then the routine has to end with the end command. So now we've defined this subroutine called sweep. And now we're going to hit the download button to download this procedure to our device. Hit spin for a second, and then it's done. Now we can come over here. Now we know about this sweep command, right? So we can run sweep. Let's try it. So I don't know how well you can see this on camera. I'll run it again. The servo basically is going to zero, and then it's stepping through one degree at a time through the 180 degrees of movement. So this is just a really simple routine, but let's, let's do something different. Maybe we want to control how much, how fast it sweeps. So let's put a W in there. Let's take a variable called W and we'll say, let's wait that amount. So now if we come back here, we can put a 20 and it should look exactly as it did last time with that hard coded 20. Oops, I have to download again. Okay, but we realize, you know, if that's too fast of a sweep or too slow of a sweep, I wanna double that speed. Let's try sweep 10. Yeah, much faster this time. Or maybe it was like way too, too um, fast. Maybe we really wanted to slow it down and have a nice slow sweep. Okay. So this is how you can sort of expand these, uh, these procedures. But like maybe let's add one more variable to this. Maybe we didn't want it to go 180 degrees. Let's call this like steps. And then we'll repeat steps. Because maybe we wanted it to sweep really quickly only for 90 degrees. Now we can do this. Let's make sure I download this first. So you see it stopped at 90 degrees this time. Okay. And now maybe what we'll do is we'll do a new routine. Let's call this one just go. And we'll say sweep 1090, sweep a little slower, 180 degrees. And then maybe we'll go back to the original sweep 1090. And now we can download that. And now what we can do is just run this go command. And that will run through this sequence of three of our sweep procedures. So first 90, then 180 a little slower, and then 90 again, and then it stops. So that's just roughly how you use this. Like this is kind of for defining these procedures, which can then be used either in the command center itself or, um, you know, procedures can call other procedures. And this is a way you can really build out more advanced programs, um, add all kinds of cool recursion to it, and really see what shakes out. Um, so let's see, were there any other questions in the chat that I've missed? Um, could you jump to blocks with the potentiometer? So, yep. um, yeah. So this is, uh, and, and the question was for um, the coding blocks, right? These blocks. Yeah. yeah. I think, okay. Yeah, using potentiometer. Disconnect over. Yeah. Let's disconnect over there. We'll come back here. Uh, right. To take a photo. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Let me, so we're going to go ahead and connect back to this. Okay, so what do we want to see? Maybe we can just do the set servo to the rotation knob value again. So if we just kind of compose these two together, set servo to read from the input port. And then we want this to happen not just once, right? But we want this to happen continuously and never stop. And then again, you can, the weight's probably not necessary. I always like to give my program a little bit of breathing room, but yeah, it's really not necessary. Let's run this. So now as I turn the knob, the servo motor is moving with me. So you can grab a screenshot here. 
Um, but again, what, like we mentioned, this doesn't take advantage of the full range of the servo. So what we can do is we can multiply it by two. Math. Math, right? Now, what kind of range does this give us? Well, read input analog goes between zero and 100. So this is now going to give us zero to 200. But some of you might say, hey, wait a minute, that's too much for the servo. The servo only goes 180. Well, we put the safe the safe checks in place so the servo won't won't um, you know send a command that it can't handle. So it will automatically stop itself at 180. But if you re but what you'll notice is the end of my rotation knob, the part that goes from 180 to 200 is not doing anything right now to the servo. So if you really want to get specific, um, we're going to add some um, some floating point math to this at some point. But for now, what you'd want to do is like times 180. And someone check my math on me because uh, doing this on the fly divided by 100, I believe. Is that right? Let's try it. So that would that would scale it to a proper range. And the only reason we had to do it this way and not this way, one point, oh, one point eight, is because we don't have a floating point math in the system just yet. We are going to add at least two decimal places, so you won't get you know quite full floating point math, but you'll at least get enough, which we think is like kind of a usable range. So once we expand the system in that way, you'll be able to do something like this. Uh, but for the meantime, you have to kind of stay in integer land, which would be multiply it first by 180 and then divide it down by 100. And then we never get it to decimal points. So it's happy with this kind of math. Do you have the monitor set up yet in, in blocks? I actually do not, so that, that's an omission, yeah. I need to add a few blocks to this one, random, the monitors, which will likely show up in the same place. Um, yeah, so right now there's, there's a couple of things missing from this language, but for the most part, it's all here. So yeah, feel free to take a photo of that. Um, once you have your projects ready in the blocks environment, at least, you can save. So this will save an XML file to your desktop. And that will be, you can use that later. Let's see, if I toss this away and then I go to open, I can open that project back up and that will restore my code that way. So if you're if you're building out blocks, it's not as easy to copy and paste like it is with text. So this is a way you can save and restore your projects. Um, I don't have a similar mechanism in the in logo environment yet. We should add a save button to save your procedures as a text file. But one thing you can do is let me see if I can go find a sample logo file. I usually just copy and paste in a text edit. Uh... Yep. Yeah, that's totally fine. You can definitely just copy and paste in there. Um, if you have a text file, like say you have a, a folder filled with text files that are all your procedures, you can then just take them and drag them and drop them in there. Um, so you can take a text file from your desktop that is logo code and just drop it into the procedures window and that will import it in there. So if you want to save the step of having to copy and paste from the clipboard, you can do that. Done like a pro. <laughs> Are there any more questions about crafty bit um, specifically for those that, that might have them in hand? There was a question from Dean just about the conversion between blocks and logo. Right. Um, I don't know how specific we'll, or how, um, you know, seamless we'll get with that. I don't know about doing a direct conversion like a toggle switch that flips back and forth between the two. Um, the, the difficulty of that is not everything that works in logo would translate to blocks, at least just yet. Um, everything in blocks, of course, goes to logo cleanly, so that wouldn't be a difficult transition. Um, but it's not clear that we'll be able to achieve everything, specifically with these subroutines, right? So when we had our sweep, this took parameters. And we don't currently have a way in the blocks environment at uh, composing a block that takes basically a stack of code that has parameters. So that's kind of the difficulty. Um, we may try to refine that, but it's not clear to me that we really need this clear mechanism to jump back and forth between the two. I mean, you know, I, I know that seems useful to some, but for the most part, I'm thinking people will probably engage just in one of these environments, not really do the, the kind of crosswalk between the two, but I could be wrong about that. Um, one thing, this will probably go away, but if, you, if you're up on the developer tools, if you go into your web console, when you compile the uh, scratch blocks, or sorry, the, the blocks here, you can actually see what logo code this compiles to. I don't know, I'll probably leave that in there just so, yeah, yeah so we don't have to hide that too much. It's definitely hidden right now, but if you wanna see the actual logo code without having to jump back, just open up your web console 
And every time you hit play, you'll be able to see what it compiles to. So actually, that's a good point. Um, sometimes if something hangs up, you I don't know in this in in the uh, in the blocks version I guess the something might shake like if it's not compiling. Yeah, in the, um, see the logo version we have the spinning box. Yeah, and actually it looks like I'm probably not handling the errors as gracefully. So if you see if I try this LED block that I broke, I must have broken this right before. So if I do this, you see I don't know how to color in start, and that's that, that's a kind of a cryptic error message. But that's what told me okay, I, I messed something up, and this just continuously spins now. So yeah, for those that might have missed that, in um, up in the when, in the top right corner, you can select the three dots and go down to more tools. And then you select the developer tools, but you wanna make sure it's on console. So when you open up developer tools, you have a bunch of different tabs. You wanna make sure it's on console and then you'll get your error messages. And that's that's very important for your, you know, checking if it's a code issue or if it's something else. Yeah. And yeah, hopefully there aren't too many of these bugs in there. We've tried to minimize that, um, but you know, this is this is still an early development and it's constantly being worked on. So there's always the potential that I, I mess something up and I break a feature. So uh, I apologize ahead of time, but <laughs> it's the nature of development. Very cool, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so uh, oh, unless there are other specific questions for Craig that way, uh, if, if he has to jump out early, there's no... All right. Uh, just one uh, quick question. Are there any yeah. other uh, uh, subheadings below crafty bits that we should be aware of? It, or is it just basically the uh, blocks and code are the two areas of your of your site? Because when you go to craftybits.net, it, it doesn't show any kind of menu of any other. Uh, yeah, so that's it for now. It's just okay. these kind of IDE placeholders. The, the homepage will be filled out um, hopefully soon. Right now, we don't have a, a definite timeline of like how to bring this to market or how we'll plan on bringing it to market. Um, my guess is probably over the next six months, we'll start to ramp up a little bit and start to develop more prototypes to share with people who are interested in playing around with it. Um, so tomorrow, what I'll do is I'll, I'll start to collect email addresses from folks who are interested in following development. And then we can, um, you know, we can send out updates and maybe get connected with you in, in a few months when we're ready to start shipping out more of the prototypes. Okay. And, and then somebody put a link in the chat about uh, where one could look at more details of the language. And that's basically, I, I think it was from uh, Leo. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Leo, I guess that's from uh, somewhere out in California. Yeah. Well, that's just mm -hmm. general logo. So that's like the Berkeley logo reference. I think that's based on, if you're not familiar. Okay. I'm not uh, familiar cool. with it all. I'm becoming familiar with it in uh, <laughs> 24 yeah. hours, but okay. Yeah. So that's, that's basically the resource that we would look at for the moment to uh, yeah. play with your site. Okay. Great. And Dean, we'll yeah. be showing yeah. some more examples in a sec to uh, using art logo, which is another, uh, which everyone can do alongside. You don't need the crafty bit for that. Uh, yeah. So there will be a, a few differences between the logo used there and what's happening right now in crafty bit. But we need to remember that the crafty bit is really like, this is, uh, I wouldn't even say this is, this is just fresh. This is like the first, I guess, demo of it publicly, right? This is, yes, yeah. So it's really an opportunity to, to have a discussion around it, but it's my, my experience of working with this stuff and students and in my own creative practice, I'm, I'm having a blast so far. So I'm really excited to see where it's going, but that's why there might be a lot of things missing so far from, from the Crafty Bit website. It's just totally just brand new. You're first in, first in the new store. Right. Well, I mean, store, it does start very store. exciting. I mean, yeah. you have a great little uh, board and it seems to be very easy to program. And it's something that I think kids are going to, are going to love. So anyway, thanks. That's great. Thanks, Dean. There's a uh, and just to highlight, I, I have to jump off myself, but I just wanted to point this out because um, in case you missed this yesterday, there's this help icon in the, uh, in the logo environment, and that will uh, toggle the commands that you have available to you. So this should roughly give you most of the logo commands that are available in this system. There might be some things missing, uh, but it should all be there. And then there was a question about the color mapping that we're using for the LEDs. And again, all of the UI in this environment needs work. But if you just want to see what that color table looks like between 0 and 100, this gives you some idea of what those colors map to. And you're working on it. Right, I do have to jump off. And um, it was great seeing everyone. And I'll join you all tomorrow uh, so we can continue the discussion. All right. Bye.
Um, so I'll just answer a couple questions in the, or, or field a couple of questions that are in the chat just before we move on. Um, Nicole, uh, you have to be on Chrome. So those who are new, if you want to experiment with, see right now it works uh, with Chrome only. So you have to use uh, Google Chrome, uh, not Firefox. Um, yeah, so that's the answer there. Um, and then, excuse me if I forgot. Uh, da -da. There was, what is the difference between Scratch and Crafty Bits? Um, that is a, a, a bigger question that maybe we'll talk about a bit now. Um, and then tomorrow, just for everyone to know, we're going to talk more about choosing the right tool. And, for, and uh, go ahead, Alec, please. I wanted to point out that when any of us say tomorrow's session, we really mean Thursday session. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. You know, that I think that's a mistake that we've each made is, and if any of us, including me, refer to tomorrow's session, tomorrow's session is happening on Thursday. That's right. Yeah. Tomorrow's is Fab TV, which will be interesting to see what that that is. Um, yeah. So so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll jump into a bit of that now, but it, on Thursday, we're going to talk more about choosing the tools. So like the difference between like, why would you choose a crafty bit over a, uh, over a micro bit? Uh, what, what are the differentiations there? And, and uh, a lot of it we talked about a bit yesterday uh, in terms of like the, sort of the framework in which you're working and, and the context in which you're coming from to programming. So um, I'm going to I'm going to actually jump on right now with uh, ask Brian to, to maybe introduce I don't know if you want to introduce logo more generally, uh, the broader scope of logo, or go into art logo. Yeah, and no, I think I, I, I think yeah, I could just take over and start with the scope of logo more generally. But uh, Leo asked a really good setup question because uh, for those of you we know Leo, and uh, one of the he's another person who's been designing educational environments. And if you ask if, if a designer of an environment asks a different designer of an environment, how is this the same or different than X? It really comes down to design sensibilities that as compared to scratch and um, as compared um, to microblocks, what uh, part of the design of crafty bits, art logo, and pretty much everything that we're showing is we try to limit things to strictly what's necessary. And we try to make things as, as contained as possible. Um, to say as simple as possible, I think I've noticed this, everybody who makes environments like this always claims that it's simple. And you come to the end of the day realizing that people disagree on what simple actually means. So I'm not gonna try to say that it's simpler, but you could say it more um, pragmatically is if you count up the number of different words that, that are the number of blocks in the system, there's probably about a fifth as many as in scratch and you know, probably an even bigger ratio um, with microblocks. <clears throat> but to get back with logo, why are we talking about logo? We expected people to be hitting us over the head with that question very, very early on in the session because um, logo was um, already old 15 years ago. So you know, we're, we're actually deeping way back into the past um, in order to try and bring, bring it back. And the reason we're bringing it back is the ideas that were around in the logo in the early days. And the, those early days actually were full fit half century ago. Some of those ideas are still relevant now. And actually it's not, doesn't fit into the talk, but I just wanted to recall um, what Obi-Wan said to Luke when he gave him the lightsaber. He said, this is the weapon of a Jedi Knight, not as clumsy or as random as a blaster, but a more elegant weapon for a more civilized age. And so the thing is, is um, it, it's, not the case, and this is the thing we're going to do in tomorrow's session that's on Thursday, is really talk about various design choices that we made with this. And, you know, why logo and why not something else is it's a language that we think is optimized for um, A, for people who are just beginning their journey along with this computational stuff, and B, for people who are making things with this computational stuff rather than people who are making applications or studying computer science. And, and again, we'll get into this more uh, on the Thursday session. But um, where Logo has a long history, like half a century ago, it was, the, it was designed as the first programming language for children. And I'd argue that until Scratch came up, it was the only programming language for children. 
and not coincidental that Scratch uh, is an intellectual descendant of Logo. Mitchell Resnick was a graduate student with Seymour Papert. Most of the programming languages that people use are programming languages that are kind of optimized for, for lack of a better word, programming. Where what we're doing is we're trying to make a programming language that's optimized for being a good, good construction material. And code as construction material is a really, really important thing. A thing that Craig showed and um, he, he showed by doing rather than really by saying is um, in, in the stuff that we're designing, the number one goal is to be able to tinker. You, we want to be able to do things quickly, to build things up and to try those things quickly. And I wanted to show you this in the context of, of Art Logo, which if, um, can I just do share screen or do you have to give me permission? Yeah. Are we all seeing it? Yes. Um, so it, it, this is Logo um, that, kind of um, resonates with the early days, but really is, is more modern in, in a number of ways. So there's people to ask what's where. There are three boxes on the screen. This box down here. Can you see my cursor actually? Yes. Okay. This box down here is where you give commands. Um, with what Craig was showing, um, the arrangement was a bit different. He had a different place where it was given direct commands. This box is where you teach logo new words. And this box is where the turtle lives. So if I just tell the turtle forward 100, this says go forward 100 steps. So the turtle draws a line 100 long. And I could tell the turtle to go right 90 degrees and the turtle will turn 90 degrees. And I can tell it to tell the turtle to go forward again. And on and on. The thing is, is um, you have to spell it right, which is one of the bugs of a text language over a blocks language. But again, we'll get into that in the Thursday session. Um, just like, and I'm feeling like I'm repeating, uh -huh, I'm repeating what Craig did by um, showing repeat. Just like um, Craig was able to do something, FD is an abbreviation for forward, RT is an abbreviation for 90. And um, you could say repeat four, forward 100, right 90 is the same as um, forward 100, right 90, forward 100, right 90, forward 100, four times. And very much like Craig did, I could just, in the place where I'm teaching logo and new words, actually, first I'll show you why I need to teach a new word. If I just ask it to make a square, um, oh, I already told it this. And it did nothing. If I just told it to make a square, it'll say, I don't know how to square. And well, the way you tell it how to make a square and actually, in the people who are here, I don't know how to do a poll and get an answer. How many people here are um, into programming in some other programming environment? Yes, no. Yeah, I know, Leo. Um, no, okay. Because one of the things is it's not clear. Um, here, so I can make a square. Yeah, let's do a square and um, clean and do a square again. And very much, um, it's funny how much this is echoing what Craig was doing, is I wasn't happy that the square was too small, so I changed the number and try again. And the advantage of teaching logo a new word is you could then repeat that new word. All right, let's make a square and then turn right an additional six degrees. And you get a big thing. Right, so what it, what it is is, when we were talking about programming back in the day, the, the way that we would talk about it is the language starts off with the vocabulary. And we didn't really talk about procedures or functions or everything. We talked about extending the vocabulary of the language. So Logo knows a bunch of words. And what you do when you're programming in Logo is you're teaching Logo new words. Now, what happens is, and I'm gonna jump up to something a little bit too quick, but that's okay, is one of the things that is the art of programming is, let me pick just randomly. Control J. You can get the stuff like this. And, you know, usually when we, we pull something like this, it looks like it's pulling a rabbit out of a hat. You know, how did you get there? Well, we got there by building it up a little piece at a time. 
And um, we can actually, I could almost build this up a little bit. Actually, the thing I told Alec I was gonna do, which may be more fun, is um, there's a very similar image that I could pull in that desktop. Are you dragging your J your PNGs onto your? your yeah, I'm now dragging a PNG onto it. I decided that I'd use this as an example because that's the one you, that we used to the intro on the presentation, and um, the way that this works is here. Why don't I um, just? We want to show other things. So I'm not going to go on repeatedly about this. Is if I said forward a thousand, back um, back a thousand. And I did write 30 here, repeat 36 times. Forward a thousand, back a thousand, right 10 degrees. You get a big star. And um, a thing that's kind of really interesting is if we here, I'll do if we go forward a thousand, but let's not go back a thousand, let's only go back 999. Then um, I need to do a clean before this. And um, that's, you could see that the thing at the middle is getting bigger. If I said 990, it's actually drawing a little, it's drawing a little circle there. So what's in this is I have a thing called circles. So if I just do clean and I do, and I use the circles procedure, which is here, repeat 36, forward a big number, back a slightly smaller number, right, right a little bit. And if I just do circle, it draws one of these. And I don't know because it's plural circles. Now, this black hole thing is um, I'm repeating circles, set the turtle to about here, set the color to a particular, and I'm going to just, in order so we can see what's happening, inside of this, I'm going to add a weight 100. Actually, I don't remember how weight. How, but I scaled weight in, in this one. Actually, I'm pretty sure I should just do weight one. And then I just do go. It'll draw that whole picture, but it'll draw it more slowly. What you could see that it's doing is it's drawing one of these circles image, then it's making the pan a little bit brighter then making it a little bit, a little bit um, brighter, narrower. And at the end, it's drawing a, a last one in white. Now, um, I could go on about this, but I think I want to pass this over to other people. The main points that I was trying to make with all of this is we're promoting, we're, we're trying to be talking about Logos programming language in a what's old again, it's new again kind of way, because we think it's actually a very good programming language for beginners, and we think it's a very good programming language for project building. Flip side is it's not a very good programming language for making the next hit video game. And, you know, it's not a good programming language for doing modern artificial intelligence research or for making, you know, websites or web services. But the thing that it is, is if you want to be doing a small to modest amount of programming and you don't see yourself as becoming a programmer, then it's a fairly good language. And once again, repeated several times is in the third Thursday session, we, we could unpack that a fair bit. Um, what I should say um, before passing this off is a thing that you should notice is at some level, what Craig was showing, what I was showing is kind of the same language driving a different kind of material. And Craig was doing this with servos and neopixels. I was doing this with forwards and rights. But the structure and the way to extend the language, the way to repeat things, it is all the same across this. So we're hoping that um, if we uh, start presenting logo in a lot of different environments, then it will again become um, something that people will take up again. Now, I wanted to um, one last caveat. Um, you could be looking at this and say that it looks a little bit complicated. John Maida wrote this great book called Design by Numbers, where he said one of the things that's really, really hard about making educational materials on computers is 
because of brilliant UI design, people expect that anything you do on a computer should be something that takes 30 seconds to learn, and by two minutes later, you're an expert in it. Now, it turns out that if you're trying to learn a new artistic medium, there's no 30 second, two minute approach to it. That in order to really learn something with expressive power, it takes time to feel out the nature of the expressiveness. And one of the reasons Scratch exists as a thing is we found that it took tens of minutes and in, in, in ridiculous amount of tens of minutes to get newbies going with logo. And once they were going, they would often use it for hundreds of hours. And we did realize that those tens of minutes were a bit of a barrier to entry for some categories of people. So what we ended up doing is building an environment that was similar in a lot of ways and shifted from, from text blocks in order to overcome the initial hurdle. Now, overcoming that initial hurdle wasn't at no cost that we like saying, you know, no floor, no ceiling. Unfortunately, when you're building these kinds of environments, when you lower the floor, you also lower the ceiling a little bit. So um, what, what we found that with Logo is a little bit harder to get started in, but once you're going, it, it, it's got, I feel, and, you know, Alec, you keep pointing this out to me that you feel that it, it's, it's actually got a better feel to it than, than most of the alternatives. Now, um, are we all set up for this? Because the thing that we'd intended to do is I would show art logo and then ask Josh to do light logo. That's still the plan? Yeah. Okay, so I'll stop sharing and let Josh take over. And unless there are questions before we do the handoff. Um, there, you know, I think Josh answered the question. I might have missed something in the chat, but I think we're good. If I miss something, please just yeah, repost it and I'll, I'll interrupt. Okay. So Light Logo is another one of Brian's micro worlds. Um, and I first learned about it, I think it was back in I just pulled up the browser window here. Um, it was at Constructing Modern Knowledge back in 2015. Um, and if you, uh, I'll drop a um, link here in the chat. Um, that's my blog and all the different posts that have to do with Light Logo. It's gonna be a little tough to kind of demo it. Um, live here and, and have you see the NeoPixels, um, but we'll, we'll make do. What I have here, and I'll plug it in and then um, hold it up to show you here, is um, a cigar box that, cigar boxes make great project enclosures, as you're probably aware. But- um, Josh, this, what do you do with the cigars? Um, well, fortunately, you don't need to even deal with the cigars. You can go to the tobacconist and they usually have a stack of these sitting around and, and they'll sell them to you for like $2 a pop. Okay. So, um, so this one has a, a Sparkfront breadboard in it. And I've also added a speaker because you can output um, notes and there's a microphone in there and um, there's a LDR sensor on the side so I can read the, the ambient um, light in the room. Um, let me share my screen here and we're going to do all of it, I think. Let me actually, we'll open up Light Logo. So Light Logo itself is um, just a, a small Java applet that runs on your computer. And from the applet itself, you can interact directly. And I'll show you that in a sec here. You can interact directly with the ring. Um, let me share the console too, so you can see what I'm typing here. Okay, so here, here's the console, and then here's my ring. And um, I can clean, and that'll erase the ring. And then the procedure I was running before, the turtle was hidden. So let's show the turtle. And there's the turtle back at, at pixel zero. Um, this is a 24 LED Neo pixel ring. Um, Sorry, Josh, can you just explain that that wasn't really um, discussed so the, the the turtle is sort of a placeholder for where you are, like a, a way of positioning yourself on the ring. 
Yes, exactly. So um, the the turtle when we're showing it is a, a white LED on the ring. And as your designs progress, you may choose to hide the turtle. Um, so that white LED isn't, isn't shining, but we'll leave it there uh, for this demo to sort of make clear what's happening. So I just, you see in the console here, I ran reset. Um, and so that set the color back to, to zero or red. And I can tell the turtle to go forward eight and it'll draw a path um, that, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight long. And then it's on pixel nine there. And then I could set the color to green and go forward eight again, and then set the color to blue and go forward eight one more time and fill the ring. And then you can get into to sort of playing around with animating it. So I'm gonna reset it and then I'm gonna loop it. So we'll just write loop and go forward eight and then set the color green, go forward eight, set the color blue, go forward eight. Let's specifically set the color red here at the beginning, go forward eight. And then when we're done with that, Let's tell it to just wait 50 and go forward one. When we do that, yeah, again, you have to type everything and make sure you have your spaces right. And it should be set color blue. There we go. There we go. Now I get a little animating pattern out of that. So just in, you know, this is all on a single line. Um, typically when you start to build things up, um, I'll share another screen here. So one project that you'll see on the, the Light Logo um, blog there, I think at the, the newest of the, the Neo pick, the Light Logo rather posts is the AirSats Nature Firefly <clears throat> procedure. And, um, I'll open that up just to show us what it looks like. But you'll see you can get a pretty interesting um, set of code. So this one, it, it's running on a, a NeoPixel strip that's 60 LEDs long. So I specifically tell it you're, you're running a 60 LED strip. And then it's looking at a, the, an LDR sensor because I, I want it to just run when the room is dark. I don't need it running when the room is light. Um, and if, if the sensor is below 10, then go ahead and show the turtle and run that firefly procedure. So like Craig showed us and like Brian showed us, Logo is a, a procedural programming language. And if you build small tools that are distinct and standalone, you can combine those small tools into big things. So I'm called Firefly, what it's doing is picking a spot randomly somewhere on that, that strip. And then I don't want it always going up. Sometimes I'd like it going down. So it's, it's, I'm creating a variable that I've named direction and it's anywhere between negative three and three. And then I have it printing it to the console just for me to debug, setting the color, to anywhere between a red up to drifting towards um, a yellow. And then the brightness I play with a bit, and then it's just gonna go forward. So it may go forward negative three, three times or four times or five times. It may go forward two, four times. And then it waits a random number and repeats that. When it's done running Firefly, again, I'm just to debugging debug it in the console. I, I'm, what is the, the LDR sensor reading? Um, waiting a random bit, hiding the turtle, cleaning everything, and then waiting a random number between one second and two and a half seconds before it does it again. If the sensor is above 10, then it just waits a millisecond, waits um, one, one tenth of a second to re-pull the, the sensor and see, is it dark in the room yet? Is it dark in the room yet? Nope, okay, I'm staying off, okay. So um, 
the um, blog, you know, does an okay job of, of the, the um, it, it can be tough to photograph or take video of, of the, the NeoPixel rings. Um, but, you know, I think this, the blog gives you a, a good sense as to the versatility of light logo and, and some kind of different ways to think about using light in your art. I led, I, I had a seventh grade advisory this past school year and I led them through using light logo at one point and asked them to build memorials. And they had the same type of ring as this um, with a little 3D printed um, Arduino shield. So the ring sits nicely on top of the Arduino and it's a nice little compact package. And I asked them program a memorial. You know, it might be a memorial to the best sandwich you ever ate. We need not be grave and heavy. I went the grave and heavy route as the adult in the room. Um, I had pre previously built a, uh, a 30 LED um, NeoPixel grid with Aaron Riley's help. Aaron's here um, with us. I, I used the laser at, at her school um, to build out this grid. So I used the, the grid to, to um, I, I found data on uh, the Atlantic uh, website um, where they counted the number of COVID fatalities in my, in my state over the course of Feb March to, of 2020 to February, 2021. And so the monument plays out on these wooden blocks um, shining on the grid below. And I use the, the Roy G. Biv, you know, the same um, color scheme. So if it's showing uh, uh, red on the ones block, we're, we're talking about a zero there. And over here, uh, it's showing white. I um, can't remember what white we ended up making it. But anywho, um, you can play through it and, and it ends up being um, you know, something that's beautiful in, in, on one hand, uh, if, if you're looking at it abstractly and something that's quite tragic, obviously, on the other hand, when you know the, the, the story behind it. Um, so representing data uh, is one way that, that I've um, uh, played with light logo. Um, let's see if there's any other good, um, you know, just packaging it in different, different ways. Like this was an upcycled box with some parchment paper. Um, you, can, you can package the NeoPixel ring in, in different ways. Here's the story of Aaron and me building that grid. Um, shining it through different lenses you know you can shine it through a, a frontal lens and get um, really interesting patterns that i ended up again using a laser and building something to project it onto my ceiling and i have a interesting light show then that i can play um, in the room uh, and then um, a, a good project that i did with um, sixth grade a few years ago um, i pushed into their language arts english classroom and they had written uh, family stories. They, they had read The Giver and had then interviewed an, a family member about a life story. And so we translated the stories into light logo um, stories, as it were. So I um, created a little um, uh, sheet for them to um, help them plot the colors and, and the animation that they were going to use. And then they um, collaged on top of uh, cigar boxes um, that, that uh, we actually bought from Amazon. So they weren't um, you know, full of nicotine uh, residue. They were just plain like crap boxes, but they collaged images that went with the stories that they were telling um, and then placed the NeoPixel ring inside the box. And we set up a tripod and a camera and they narrated their stories off camera and their light logo procedures were written and timed in a way that the story then um, played out uh, in light um, on the on the NeoPixel ring along with their, their narration. So um, yeah, I hope my blog can kind of give you a, a sense as to the variety of different projects. My second book, um, which uh, Alec, uh, um, mentioned yesterday, um, the Invented Learn Guide to More Fun has a chapter on, on light logo. I, I have to say that like, that, um, you know, I, I definitely spend time weekly in, in uh, 
turtle art and and you know I'm, I'm always looking around at different patterns in the world that might make a good turtle art pattern but when i really want to like think and um and and tinker and play around with code i've i've really found light logo to be a, a fascinating micro world um you know part of it's the the fascination of the blinking lights going in the, the room it does drive my wife a little crazy i have like two light logo um, projects playing on the the desk with the the kitchen computer there um, but you know she humors me so any questions about light logo that i might be able to answer that or that brian might better be able to answer have you um what's the relationship with math and logo that you've had maybe with students I find that that's you know something that is an important aspect of computational thinking and just working with this stuff and and I find it uh, it's sort of a just curious if that's embedded somehow in the way that logo logo is structured or the way that you've worked with it. I know that I personally haven't you know and I've worked with it in turtle art with students as young as third grade here in the state so. Um, how old is that seven eight um all the way up to i just led a turtle art workshop this morning with with middle school and, and high school um students um so it it scales really well but i i never really try to um ex, you know explicitly say okay we're turning on the math now but i do like to sort of point out early in the in the turtle art exploration that everything is a number and that like opens some interesting doors you know like color is just another number and so you can easily use the store in box for example um, to set a variable and then change that color as the turtle progresses through the design so i you know i don't i don't really specifically sit down and, and and point out like the arithmetic we're doing today for example i made a big point of talking about how a big part of using a computer is being lazy and so in terms of like the repeats i was having the turtle calculate that so when we were doing designs that were built on rotation I was saying, okay, you know, early on, I one of the students identified if I go all the way around, we're going 360 degrees. So I was doing a lot of repeat 360 divided by 20, you know, and having the turtle do the math for me, just to show them that like it's all numbers and the turtle can do the math. <laughs> so yeah, could I actually um, jump in a little bit? Please. In, in the early days of Logo, um, Seymour Papert was talking about Logo or using computers with Logo as a math land, where the analogy that he made is, if you want to learn French, what do you do? You move to Paris and you immerse yourself in French. What he felt would be a, an interesting thing to do is have an environment where you could immerse yourself in math and pick it up naturally the way people pick up language somewhat naturally. And the thing that you said about numbers, Josh, is um, um, since we are planning on talking a little bit about design decisions, the fact that turtle art represents, um, you pick colors by numbers was an explicit choice. As it turned out, um, we, the code base for turtle art came from the code base for the Pico Cricket. And we had a color slider that we were using for the Pico Cricket. Right. So in order to not in order to have a slider um, would have required zero work in order to limit it to numbers required positive work. And I thought about it and I really thought, let me be annoying. And in the efforts of having this thing be math land, let it be numbers. So people could say, you know, it's just a number and I could change numbers with arithmetic. You can't say red plus five. And if you want to be doing something with repetitions, with variations, having it be numbers is, is it's not a bad idea. Um, on top of that, um, Josh, what you were saying is you're not being explicit about the math in it. That's really fine. 
you know, I think that the message, the unsaid message, but it's not the unheard message, is numbers, arithmetic, and code are building materials just like crepe paper and neopixels and wood. Exactly, exactly. And that also breaks down any, you know, preconceived apprehension people have walking into the room that, oh, I'm no good at math. I can't possibly be good at this, you know? Well, there's a classic story that reproduced itself a couple of times is uh, we're working with a classroom and they put together some wonderful project that's, you know, doing a lot of the kind of arithmetic that you were talking about. And at the end of the session, um, Seymour says to the kid, you know, you've been doing math and the kid just holds their head and said, and Seymour says, what's the problem? Uh, the kid says, doing math always made my head hurt. <laughs> um, so so I, um, I, I don't know, to check if there's any other questions. What I can do is show a bit of like some of the stuff I've done with Logo, which is a little out, outside the box a bit in the sense of like trying to, I've been yeah. very interested in pushing Logo Actually, Alex, before yeah. you get outside the box, fully in the box, do you want to pull the box from behind you and show it to people? Come on. Yeah, this is yeah. a student project. Um, let me just, yeah. Okay, so. Um, zoom out. Okay, so there's a we we had um, some grade seven students sh coming to us in the fab lab to you know they wanted to make something and we got them working on these programmable light boxes. So this is they designed the box case. Uh, they learned how to draw draw the tabs and things like that. Um, this is something that we could talk about with Leroy af uh, with Leo uh, afterwards. Um, this inside here we put a, a neo uh, pixel ring. And uh, Craig, uh, our lab technician, designed this little bracket just so that they all they had to do was screw on the ring. So it was a bit of a kit. Um, and then they used light logo on the box. Uh, sorry, on on um, the Arduino. We had a bunch of Arduinos lying around that were gathering dust. So we gave them each an Arduino. And um, yeah, so basically this this student's procedure is just randomly changing the LEDs. Uh, one off from each other. So it's, it's, it, it sort of slowly adds as a fade. So when you look at the LEDs, it looks like you can see the, the change in color more drastically, but when you put on the cap, which they designed, it's a subtle change in, in, in hue. And um, they learned how to, part of this was also learning how to vector draw. So we showed them how to um, basically do draw silhouettes. So they, they found a picture that they were intrigued in and they would draw a silhouette. And then they had a, a, a button, uh, sorry, a on off switch, which they could use to either uh, change the program or turn it off. So it'd be off would be clean. Uh, so it'd be empty and that's not really off, but it's the LEDs are, are, are not shining any light right now, for whatever reason, I haven't, I haven't checked, but this, they're, they're, the program isn't set uh, to do that. So that's what this one is. And we had a lot of really um, good, uh, a good time with working with students uh, and embedding this stuff in lamps. So lamp design was a big thing that we did in grade 11 uh, last year. So senior school and then grade seven students wanted to do it. So we had a bunch of students doing uh, lamps and I can show um, just quickly. Uh, let's go to the, our, our, our Instagram page. Um, so here we have our programmable light boxes uh, and I can And so they would put that on. So they did all the drawing. Uh, we helped just, eventually we realized it took a long time for them to make the box and you started losing your audience a bit. So we focused the, uh, the, the drawing on the drawing, the silhouettes. And um, yeah, so, and I what, what's nice about this, and this is something that is really, I, I have to say as a facilitator, this is a big deal. We're running around dealing with different projects, different students, different ages in a lab. I could leave a student with that, you know, your the the reference docs for light logo and give them a couple tricks and say, go walk around. And I don't have them hunting me down to ask questions. 
it's not working, et cetera. And that's a big deal. So we could actually really get them um, um, creating. Uh, here's an example of a lamp. Uh, so this student, uh, we crammed all the electronics in a case uh, and, oops, sorry. I don't know if I have a switch, but basically uh, he had two um, input buttons and a, and a potentiometer. So one was to turn it off and he made the other one to change the color of the ring and then the, and the potentiometer, uh, actually no, one was a reset. One was to turn it off and the, other, the potentiometer changed the color of the ring. Um, and just like these kids came back day after day you know, just to finish this project, they were motivated and they didn't feel, you know, they weren't intimidated. Um, so it was really nice to embed light logo into objects. I found that really, really um, a lot of fun. Um, so that's it for, you know, the light logo. Um, the students generally um, will really, oh yeah, and here, this is an example of, they were on their iPads though. So we teach them how to, to draw silhouettes on their iPad. So, um, and then this is just a bit more of the process. Um, and then, yeah, I, oh yeah, here we go. This is another one. And so this push button. So yeah, it, that was a, a lot of fun um, for the students. And I just, you know, I, I, I remember Brian, we talked a little while ago about this, but um, when I was learning this stuff and I'm like learning how to use Arduino to make blinky lights and sensors work, I was doing a lot of like in interaction design. So I made a, a, an, an installation once where the seat here was a bunch of sensors and it made a video play. And I was really just using the Arduino as a sensor way to gather data, uh, inputs from, from users. And I was talking to, to Brian and, and I was curious why watching him use logo, I was very intrigued and I, I found like I kind of got it a little more easily. And I was curious why more people, more artists weren't using this logo. And it became a, a long conversation that isn't ending um, anytime soon, but it, it, it sort of made me think, well, if you could, and Brian's been doing projects like sending, uh, he hasn't talked about this much, but logo has been used to control a satellite, right? A little what? yeah 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 um it we uh, that, that, that's a longer story but let's keep that to thursday yeah yes. so so it was a tool for a purpose that was a lot more complicated than what i wanted to do so i decided i would start using logo in all my projects so fab academy i used logo um and and then last year i was just curious the diff you know using logo as if it were processing so this is a little um again i i don't want to we're going to talk more about tools but all these projects that normally you would do in processing, I was doing in logo and having a lot of fun with it. Um, and so- I it, mentioned this this morning, Alec, that seeing your work in art logo, it's so different from the work that I do in art logo. <laughs> and, yeah. But it was very inspiring to me in its difference, that the tool itself is, is you know, wide enough walls that, that you and I can have completely divergent styles and, and still use the same tool. Yeah, and I, I find that what's nice about it is that I have I have yet found a reason where I'm like, okay, this is not doing what I need it to do. There's a couple things, uh, maybe, you know, grabbing data from the internet and, and you know, like doing some more, um, you know, I was, I'm curious to see how we can, you know, communicate with um, web protocols and such just to, or, or APIs and uh, embedding it in different ways, but, um, you know, and just this, this, this is these broken screens are all. Um, it's actually programmed in logo, so the the crack and everything. And I couldn't do that. I don't think I could do that the way that I know how to code. I've I've worked with processing, but for me, it was really it was so easy to draw a line and be like, that's not the right position. Change the degree a bit, add a little thickness, and I was able to recreate a, a cracked screen, which I I I was I thought was fun. Uh, and I'm just going to show one more thing here, and then and then we'll leave it. Um, there is a, uh, sorry, it's not the fastest way to go through this. Um, these are all logo pro light logo projects. Uh, so, sorry, art logo projects. And so art logo um, as an animation tool. Um, so I was just trying to recreate hair uh, and I was curious to see if I can really make sort of like a, a windswept kind of look. Um, and then there's one more that I wanna show the tinkerability of logo quickly and we'll leave it at that. Um, these are all, again, logo projects. This is a mistake. 
but I loved it. That's another thing. So I, 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 these little half circles are supposed to be up here at the base of these the strands of hair. And the fact that they, I, I'm, it's like the tri drawing the house in logo, you're supposed to put the triangle on top of the house. I had one of those moments. Uh, and for me, this was like the accident that happened because I was tinkering. Um, and then here, I'll scrub through this, but basically, um, the, I, I oh, it may take a while to load. Yeah, so I started with a line and I'm just messing around with little, like, so what's nice is that you're building your own library. You build little tools that you work on and then you create those named procedures and then they become libraries that you can mess around with. Uh, sort of like a library of, of objects that you can mess around with. And so uh, I'm not gonna be able to fast forward unless I'm in YouTube. Um, so this was, this was a, um, a way that you can experiment. Uh, let's just see if there's one more. No. Yeah, so I'm not gonna waste anybody's time here right now, but I wanted to scroll through this because it gets a lot more interesting. Oh, here we go. So as we go along, um, So just paying, playing with the, the, the pen thickness, I hide the turtle because it's more aesthetically for me, it's, it's what I, I'm, I'm interested in. I hide the turtle and I just pay, play with the, the pen thickness and then um, got into sort of trying to animate randomness. So this one little sketch, this one little block of, of, of code on the other way, I could get a variety of crazy different uh, you know, aesthetics. And it, it was a way for me to sort of say, well, what's I'm just tinkering. And that ability uh, to do with just a, a few words and some text was really powerful. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I have been having a lot of fun with it as you know, from, from a, a perspective, not in, in the teaching world, but, in the, but it's certainly making me appreciate what it's capable of. I added to the chat um, a link to the curriculum that I just wrote and I'm gonna use in a workshop next week uh, that'll get you here. And the reason why I bring this up is um, there's a, a whole page under this home menu, hardware setup and software that'll uh, walk you through um, setting up the ring and loading the uh, software onto the, the Arduino. Uh, in this case, I also use an Adafruit Metro Mini oftentimes on these, and then some getting started projects um, linked to the reference, uh, programming that design that I did in front of you with the, the um, RGB, and then writing the procedures in a text editor and uploading them, and then some ideas to take it a little further, including the link to um, Eric Nauman's NeoPixel Ring Shield that makes for a nice package on the Arduino. Uh, the notes that you can use if you hook a speaker up um, to the, the Arduino, you can add that for some reason. The, well, I know exactly why. The seventh grade boys who I was working with, who I showed them could play notes, they immediately figured out how to play the Russian anthem on it. So um, lots of fun, you know. Perfect. Um... So yeah, and, and uh, I'm trying to think, is there any other questions about logo or? No. Erin, are you still on the, I know Erin was working on something. I don't know if she wanted to show it today or, or tomorrow. Oh, hi, yeah, hi. I'm here. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you presented a challenge yesterday. Yes. And I took I took on the challenge. Good. Thank Good. you. Me too, Aaron. Good. You did? Yeah. Do you want to share first? Or do you want no, me to I go? want you to share first. And then and then um all right. So um I don't have a I don't have a board, but I happen to have a micro bit kicking around. So I went ahead and started with that. And I'll give you the I'll give you the backstory here. So um, my, my son and I, my younger son and I have been kind of, um, we haven't been doing as much because of COVID this summer. Our plans were kind of um, stymied. So we've been um, spending a lot of time playing ping pong on our dining room table, um, just the two of us. <laughs> and we have this little setup and I thought it would be fun to make, you know, those, um, you know those foam fingers that they have at like sporting events that people wave in the audience to like root on their team? 
So I thought it would be kind of fun to make a foam finger. So um, your challenge was to create something out of, I think you said 70% of yeah. these cardboard. Yeah. Um, to, so yeah, this yeah, is 100% yeah. <laughs> cardboard. Um, it's a little hand and then it says number one. Um, and so yesterday I was really kind of just working on the mechanism. I found a little, I don't know if you can see this, but uh, it's kind of dark. Um, but I found a servo motor. So I just like played around with the mechanism and I hooked it up to a, um, a board here. So I'll just turn this on. And I haven't really done anything. I don't have any other like add-ons, um, but I can play around with. Yeah. I might try to set up a little sensor, like a touch sensor of some sort. Okay, so here we go. Oh. <laughs> it's crazy. So it's it's in the background, like cheering you on. <laughs> and that's that's so a that's lot of cardboard. Prototype. It's not too heavy for the servo. Is it a is it a little five volt servo or is it is it stronger than that? No, it's just a little mini one here. I can show you really quick how I um let's see if I can. Oh. Let me get my flashlight so you can see inside here. So when I'm building things out of cardboard, I really like to start with the mechanism and then I'll, I figure out the programming later. Yeah. So I don't know. Can you see in yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little... So I basically just built a little cage um, for the motor. And then I just made sure that it was supported by this kind of collar. So there wouldn't be too much friction. Um, and I, I screwed in, um, with a piece of hardware, the, the actual cardboard hand. Yeah. So it would be nice and stable. So the, the mechanism is nice and stable now, and I can like figure out from there and I can, I can get my, um, I can program it and then just figure out the rest. That's a neat approach to do the mechanism first. Cause I think a lot of like, and I, I've seen that so many times with students where you, you end up building the thing and then trying to put the mechanism in the thing and and it, nothing works because it just doesn't it doesn't work in, in terms of the physics of the object yeah yeah so yeah mechanism first for me a lot a lot of times it's helpful in this case i built the thing first <laughs> jam the mechanism <laughs> that's awesome aaron thank you you bet so my story is that across the street from us, um, there's a, a, a nesting uh, yellow crown night heron uh, uh, with two chicks. And, and it seems one of the adults um, hangs around. So um, I started yesterday again with Alex's suggestion that we focus on, on cardboard. And I built out this... Um, let me turn this a little bit and see if the, yeah, that, that's gonna be better. So I built out the, this tree limb. So I have the, the side of a tree here and, um, and a whole limb that there, there's a nest up here. <laughs> and then um, if, I, if I press the, I'm, I'm one of the lucky recipients of the crafty bit here. So if I, if I press the button on the crafty bit, I plug in here. I may have drained my battery here, but let's see here. Yeah, I drained my battery. But anywho, what what will happen next? You'll see on Thursday is is the servo here has this little guy attached to it, so he moves back and forth in and out of the nest. Like the when I got the binoculars out and looked up into the nest, one of them was peering out over the side. So he'll uh, he'll come up. And then, as I said, I ordered um, I ordered uh, the NeoPixel rings, um, smaller ones. But right now, I have housed in the back here. I'll give you the the back view, so um, you can see the the servo attached. But I also have a, a NeoPixel ring set up, and so um, when it's dark out, I can turn that NeoPixel ring on and it's just running a light logo procedure that slowly fills in an eight LED ring with yellow. And so it, it gradually gets brighter on our, our little night heron. Thank you. That's great. I'm glad. I don't know. Are, are there anybody, is there anybody else here working on something that they can share? I'm not, I'm, 
hoping to have something tomorrow as well, but I've been kind of running behind on other things. All right. Well, I encourage anybody that's here to come on tomorrow, sorry, tomorrow's Thursday, to come on Thursday session at 1.30 um, and make something in cardboard and we'll have a big share uh, session afterwards and try and embed some programmable element into it. Um, and, and then we'll just have fun talking about that. And I think um, on, on Thursday, again, we'll talk again about tools um, and we can maybe extend that uh, to tools and digital fabrication. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that is it, unless there's more, there's more, we have a, a little bit of well, five minutes. So that's not bad, actually. We did a good job there. All right. Well, thanks everyone. It was really, uh, this has been a lot of fun. I, I enjoy uh, seeing what everyone's up to and, and, and uh, I, I look forward to seeing more uh, doing this again on Thursday. So just to clarify Thursday at one thirty Eastern time. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. One thirty Eastern same time. It should be the same link, I think even, but yeah, same time. And, um, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank Alec. Thanks, Thanks Brian. Everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.